So welcome everyone to the 2022 President's Address for the 159th NAS Annual Meeting. It's great to see so many people back here in the auditorium, and I want to also welcome all the people online for whom this is being live streamed. With special apologies to all of you on the West Coast who probably really don't like getting up at six o'clock on a Saturday morning. So first of all, it's great to see the Academy coming back to life in person, to actually be able to see people in three dimensions. Here are a few pictures of uh, activities that have been happening recently. A picture of the new US-Israel Blavatnik Forum, which was held here in um, uh, the NAS building and by all accounts was very successful. Here's a picture of John Anderson, the president of the National Academy of Engineering and myself with the Merzion Fellows. And the picture on your right is um, some new collaborative space that we've uh, built over in the Keck building with the idea that the time that people will be in the office, they'll be there to collaborate, not to walk into their offices, close the door, and do something that could easily be done at home. And so we really wanted to reorient our space to encourage collaboration and make people realize the joy of getting back together with their colleagues again. Though this slide also reminds me the importance of thanking all of you for all the hard work that everyone put in over the last two years of the pandemic. It was not a given that an organization that actually depends on the convening of smart minds would survive something like the pandemic. And yet everyone stepped up, the staff stepped up, put in incredible hours. All of you as volunteers and members did the same. We not only survived the pandemic, but we managed to execute our mission very well during that time. And so again, I just wanna thank you all. If there's one lesson we've learned from the last two years, it's that virtual engagement is here to stay. It increased our reach of the Academy's work by at least an order of magnitude. And so now we have to do a careful analysis of yeah, but what did we lose? And how can we move forward with the best of both in order to uh, maintain our reputation for quality guidance for science influencing policy? Now the report I'm going to give today, I, I'm going to highlight a few activities here at the Academy. It is in no way comprehensive. My apologies ahead of time to any volunteers or staff members whose favorite program was not presented today. There was no way to cover everything, but what I try to do is over the years at least rotate around and pick up different um, activities uh, in different years. As I've done in the past, I'm going to organize my presentation around the uh, goals and objectives of the strategic plan of the National Academy of Sciences because we're all using that as our guide star in order to try to prioritize what we're doing in order to make progress on targeted actions. So here is the first goal of the strategic plan, uh, to apply science for the benefit of humanity. It has three specific objectives under it, to catalyze action, to build communities across disciplines and cultures, and to increase capacity in the US and abroad. So I'll give you some examples on each of these objectives of what the Academy's doing. So first, in terms of catalyzing action, there's probably no more urgent need for action than on climate change. And uh, this slide here shows um, some pictures from the horrible wildfires we've been having in the US, primarily in the West. Uh, the picture on your right was actually taken at my home in California um, when wildfires were raging on three sides of us. And you know that you can see what the air quality was. It was uh, horrible. 
Uh, climate change uh, was, um, has been addressed by perhaps more reports of the Academy than any other topic. In particular, there was a very influential 2016 report on climate attribution that showed that such events as this are getting more frequent, they're becoming more extreme, and they're becoming more deadly. So this is a place where we really have to catalyze action. And we have to mount a response that's commensurate with the emergency and with its scale and its complexity. Um, we're entering what is perhaps the final decade in which we can actually take meaningful action to stem the worst of the impacts. So addressing climate change is um, also intrinsically linked to uh, moving towards a more just and equitable society. The problem with the Academy's approach to this has been that despite all these great reports we put out, there has been no mechanism for sustained engagement to make sure that there's action on the climate problem until now. So we are establishing a new climate crossroads. And let me just kind of run through what's different about how we're approaching the new climate crossroads than what has been the standard approach here at the Academy. The standard approach is deliberative. We put together a, uh, an esteemed committee and we can take two years to do something. We don't have two years to deal with all of these issues. But during the pandemic, we learned from great work in our health and medicine division and our division on behavioral social sciences and education that we actually can move fast to respond to a crisis, the COVID-19 crisis. So what we're doing now with this climate crossroads is we're taking lessons that we learned from the pandemic in order to create a pace that will respond to the climate crisis. In our standard approach, we're largely organized by disciplines. A discipline like um, a Division of Engineering and Physical Sciences will take the lead on a project. What's new with the crossroads is it is our very first pan-divisional effort. It includes all the um, divisions across the academy because, of course, we need engineering for solutions. We need earth and life sciences in order to understand how the systems work. Um, we need uh, the transportation research board involved because transportation is one of the largest emitters, but also a, um, a, a low-hanging fruit in terms of reducing emissions. Uh, we need uh, the social sciences because, after all, we have to encourage people to take action and uh, understand what will motivate them for doing that. I also think we have to involve the social sciences because, let's face it, there is a huge risk here of us disappointing people. If we urgently move to address climate now, we know that despite all of the changes that people will make, the planet will continue to warm. And that's because there's a certain amount of heating that is already baked into the system. And so people will get discouraged when they don't see response. You imagine what it would have been like if after vaccinating all sorts of Americans, we suddenly found out that there was no difference in the hospitalization rate between those vaccinated and those not vaccinated. That would have been a disaster. So we have to message this appropriately so that people do not get discouraged. Um, in addition, um, under the standard approach, we answer questions that are typically posed in uh, conjunction with the sponsors. But what we're going to do with this new effort is we're going to do an enterprise-wide fundraising activity so that we can ask the really big questions that are broader than any one sponsor or any one discipline. It will also um, uh, 
create opportunities for us to react faster. A good example of a program that's been able to do that is the Gulf Research Program. Thanks to the funding that they received from the settlements of Deepwater Horizon, they have been able to ask the big questions and instantly act on them. Also, under our um, sort of standard approach, we provide a report to a sponsor, and then we sort of leave it to the sponsor to decide which of the recommendations and actions they're going to take on. We need to actually catalyze those actions. We need to make sure that actions happen. A good example of doing this now is with our action collaborative on sexual harassment in academia. That is actually bringing together stakeholders and leaders and actually making sure that, that we move forward in um, uh, implementing that report. So that's what we're going to do with the climate crossroads. We've always had arm's length for objectivity from uh, the involved stakeholders whenever we do a consensus report. Whereas we do have roundtables that engage those stakeholders in the conversation. So that's what we're going to be doing with the crossroads. We want the automobile industry involved. We want the electric utilities involved. We want the construction industries involved because we have to get all of them working together to solve this problem. And in the past, everything's been project-based. There's a day that it starts when the money arrives. There's a day that it ends when the money runs out. And that means we don't get sustained engagement. But by uh, building a uh, uh, funding for this in advance, we can sustain our engagement through to success. So we're quite excited about this um, new endeavor. Um, the Crossroads has identified, oh, but what hasn't changed, yes, is adherence to evidence dependence on experts, quality control, and balancing bias. So we are not going to be sacrificing our standards in this new climate crossroads. So the um, crossroads, climate crossroads has identified uh, to begin with four um, theme areas or pathways to action. Um, these are all cross-cutting uh, in terms of the disciplines involved. They are at the intersection of climate, health, equity, uh, et cetera. Um, so you see accelerating decarbonization. Um, that's essential for mitigating climate. Tackling the intersection of climate, health, and equity. Cultivating climate resilient communities. This is something that we've also been doing through our Resilient America program and through the Gulf program. We're going to learn from uh, their pilots and uh, try to expand on that. And then, of course, ensuring that natural systems thrive. All of, and these are not um, by any means exclusive. We're also looking at a possible pathway in climate economics. And uh, other topics are also possible. So let me go on to my second topic uh, under catalyzing action. And that's the US role in global ocean plastic waste. Um, this was a report that just came out on December 1st of last year. Um, the findings and recommendations um, uh, show that here the United States is a major producer of plastics. In 2016, it generated more plastic waste by weight per, and per capita than any other nation. You notice I've got these little plastic bottles here. I never use them. I bring my own reusable mug up here so that uh, I'm not contributing to it. Um, and the report calls for a national strategy by the end of this year to do it. So what kind of action is happening as a result of this report? Well, the findings and recommendations were picked up by more than 100 news outlets. There have been 18 briefings on the report to Congress, OSTP, NOAA, EPA, and the State Department. After the briefing at EPA, the agency indicated that they would use that report to develop the national strategy to come out of EPA. California didn't even wait. They already adopted the interventional framework that was recommended in the report as part of California's statewide microplastics strategy. Um, in addition, there are several large meetings coming up soon that um, have uh, 
uh, planned sessions around the report. Uh, one example is the 2022 uh, Ocean Sciences meeting that's coming up, and another session at the 7th International Mar Marine Debris uh, Conference. Okay, another um, way to catalyze action uh, is to issue reports that speak directly to the public and to policymakers uh, as well. Um, a growing body of evidence has sounded the alarm that biodiversity on this planet is at great risk, and this is the biodiversity that supports and maintains um, our life and society. The concern is that the significance of these biodiversity declines are not readily understood. Um, you know, people are concerned about polar bears, but also, are they concerned about amphibians? Are they concerned about insects? There are all sorts of biodiversity declines that are not on the radar of the public. So uh, we put out a, a report called Biodiversity at Risk, Today's Choices Matter. It was released in January, and it's a booklet developed to reach a non-technical audience. Explains what biodiversity is, why it is important, why it's in crisis, what are the drivers for the crisis, and what we can do to stem those losses. Um, there, uh, this was a collaboration across six different boards in the Division of Earth and Life Studies. And the booklet's going to be promoted at, um, for example, the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is coming up. We're also developing partnerships with NGOs and advocacy groups, philanthropies, teachers, museums, zoos, um, to disseminate the book to general audiences um, so that we can extend beyond the Academy's usual reach. Um, so my next example of catalyzing action um, is that the U.S. is finally waking up to the deep hole we've dug ourselves in because of underinvestment in infrastructure. It's a problem made even more urgent by growing threats from climate change, and also natural disasters such as hurricanes. However, the magnitude of the problem, its complexity, the uncertainties, and the um, knowledge that we know we need, um, it, and, and the knowledge that the actual investment is always going to exceed the resources available, have actually paralyzed action on this. So there's a new analysis out from the Transportation Research Board um, that presents an analytical framework to assure that resilience is considered throughout the lifetime of new systems. And um, the report recommends that we first start by creating um, detailed asset inventories. We assess future hazards um, in each case. We predict the vulnerability of the assets from the hazards that are predicted, and only after doing all three of those, the inventory, the hazards, and the vulnerability to the hazards, can we actually do a cost-benefit analysis of where we should be investing and what are the, the biggest bangs for the buck. Uh, now, I, I mentioned previously um, how helpful it has been to use our Gulf Research Program as a test ground for uh, pilot studies. So um, one of the actions by the Gulf Research Program was that last November, in fact, um, uh, curiously, on the very same day that President Biden signed his landmark Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the uh, Gulf Research Program convened a three-day interactive workshop of government people and um, people, leaders from the Gulf Coast, um, to work through how best to prioritize their resilient infrastructure investments around the Gulf region. Um, what they used was a gaming approach, but a serious game that they uh, used, where participants worked together to utilize their analytic and their decision-making skills in the context of two hypothetical extreme events. Not surprisingly, a hurricane and an oil spill. Um, the central insight from this exercise, what everyone came away with, 
was the understanding that these, uh, the foundation for infrastructure resilience is not how well you execute an individual project, but rather how can you create a resilient system? It doesn't do any good to have really resilient roadways if the levees all fail and flood them anyway. So um, it's essential that uh, infrastructure planning take this big picture view. Avoid cascading consequences where one failure creates another failure, creates another failure because they cascade down. And avoid single points of failure by having redundant systems. Community involvement was critical as well in this exercise. And um, obviously, uh, the group was very focused on issues of equity as well. Um, the event generated a great deal of enthusiasm, and a follow-up is now being planned. Now, let me go on to the second objective under the first goal, and that is building communities across disciplines and cultures. And my example from that is the launch of the first new journal uh, that we've had here at the academies in, you know, I don't know how many decades. Um, but I've compared on this slide PNAS, our um, longstanding uh, high-quality journal, with the new journal called PNAS Nexus. So PNAS encompasses all the divisions of the National Academy of Sciences. Social sciences, environmental sciences, physical sciences, um, uh, life sciences. But PNAS Nexus is even broader than PNAS because it incorporates all the disciplines in the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Medicine, with special emphasis on papers that include two or more of those uh, different fields of inquiry, hence the name Nexus, bringing together these different fields. A PNAS is now a hybrid journal. You can uh, have it, uh, your paper open access, but many are behind paywalls, whereas Nexus is going to be fully open access. Everything is open access from the get-go. Um, PNAS has an editorial board of uh, NAS members, whereas the editorial board for Nexus is drawn from the NAS, the NAE, the NAM, not only the membership, but other um, strong people in those disciplines who can um, add to the quality and the span of the journal. What is not different in both of them is they have high standards for the quality and the impact of what they publish. So I urge you um, to consider Nexus uh, for uh, future publishing, especially in cases where you need to reach a broad audience that is not simply academic. Um, another activity in um, the past year that builds communities across disciplines and cultures is the growing number of uh, partnership projects we have with the Nobel Prize Foundation. Some of you will remember that immediately after last year's annual meeting, we held the first ever Nobel Prize Summit in conjunction with the Nobel Foundation it was called Our Planet, Our Future. We had almost 28,000 registrants from 210 countries and territories. I didn't even know that there were 210 countries and territories. But as, as I was signing into it, the little chat would pop up, hello everyone from Azerbaijan, and Mauritius here, so excited to join today. I mean, it was just fun to see the community of people coming together for this summit. Um, we also had uh, a number of um, uh, high-level um, speakers in addition to 32 Nobel laureates. They included the Dalai Lama, uh, John Kerry, and the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. Um, the, uh, after the meeting, 122 Nobel laureates signed an urgent call for action that was widely circulated. So we're now planning on the second Nobel Prize Summit, which will happen next year in May. And um, the focus of the second summit is on misinformation and disinformation. So I hope you will all uh, put that on your calendars. Um, 
A second part of our growing partnership with the, uh, with the Nobel Prize Foundation is that in um, December of last year, they called and asked whether the National Academy would be uh, willing and able to host the prize ceremonies for that year's Nobel laureates. Now, for those of you who know the Nobel um, program well, normally there is a big gala event in Stockholm. Well, given the uncertainty about the pandemic, they felt that the gala in Stockholm might be a bad idea, but they wanted to have some kind of ceremony in the host country for each of their laureates in order to um, make them feel celebrated and um, uh, their uh, contributions uh, well recognized. So we held two different ceremonies, one for the East Coast laureates and one for the West Coast laureates. And so the attendees were uh, Joshua Angrist, David Card, Guido Imbens, David Julius, uh, Sakuro Manabi, David McMillan, and Artem Padapudian. Um, and uh, quite a few um, of you members who were either local to the DC area or local to the Irvine area attended those ceremonies. Um, they had panel discussions and they were really a lot of fun and um, we enjoyed that. It wasn't, of course, quite the same as being in Stockholm, but uh, it, was, uh, it was second best. Okay, the third objective under the first goal of the strategic plan is to increase capacity in the U.S. and abroad. Well, over the last year, rather than working to increase capacity, we actually had to work to prevent erosion of capacity because, frankly, it was not a really good year for international scientists in quite a few countries. Um, the fall of Afghanistan was incredibly swift. No one expected the nation to buckle that quickly. Um, after the U.S. troops withdrew. And um, the Academy's amazing staff in our Policy and Global Affairs Division, Von Tarikian, Kathy Bailey, um, Franklin Carrero Martinez, recognized that we had scholars in that country who were at risk of being imprisoned or worse by the Taliban because of their connections to capacity building programs here in the US. So the first thing we did was we called up Google and wiped the web of their connections to the US so that it would not be easy for anyone in the Taliban to find out who these people were. Then we mounted a rescue effort to get them out of Afghanistan. Now, um, the, the problem we perceived was that the US government was so focused on getting translators and other people who had helped the military out of the country that the US government actually wasn't even thinking about scientists or the risk that they were in. So um, we felt we were pretty much on our own. Um, the, um, so so the, the plot twists and turns in this are um, really uh, too, too long to go into. Um, but let me tell you, this is truly worthy of a Hollywood blockbuster about how the, the chance encounters with people that allowed us to build a network to get these people out of the country. We literally were rescuing people from the sewers in uh, Kabul uh, near the airport and getting them um, to, uh, through the border into Pakistan and other places uh, after the airport shut down. Um, the uh, picture on the right shows many of these scholars now in much happier times where they have university positions now in Rwanda. And you might think, why Rwanda? Well, what was interesting about Rwanda was that the leadership of Rwanda remembered how France took them in during the Rwandan genocide and they wanted to pay it forward. And so they accepted these um, Afghan scientists. And the important thing is they gave them safety, education, a place to live, and the dignity of having a job. And the, the outcome of that is that these scholars are not considered refugees. So they have an easier path to permanent resettlement anywhere in the world 
because they're not classified as refugees. So um, this was uh, uh, an amazingly successful program. Um, it was made possible through the donations that you give as members to my discretionary fund that we were able to instantly mobilize to save these people. And we're also grateful for a critical um, uh, grant that we got from the David and Lucille Packard Foundation that also helped with this effort. So after Afghanistan, the news just kept getting worse because then Russia, less than two months ago, invaded the Ukraine. So against all odds, Ukraine has not fallen. Um, but the exodus of those who are seeking asylum in uh, Poland, in um, Romania, uh, and other Eastern European nations has now topped five million. And among them are many scientists and their families, mostly women, because the men have stayed to defend their homeland. And once again, the NAS sprung into action to help these displaced scientists as well. Um, our greatest fear in this case was actually different than Afghanistan. We were worried that they would diffuse so far away from, or from Ukraine that they would not be available once the fighting ends to go back and rebuild their country. We saw uh, various universities trying to cherry pick the best and brightest from Ukraine, and we felt that that was not in the long-term benefit of Ukraine. So we established a collaboration with the Polish Academy of Sciences. And uh, our collaboration involves uh, the Polish Academy and the NAS together um, certifying which scientists um, are um, truly scientists and um, need to be placed. The Polish Academy then found positions for them in Polish research institutions and they found housing for them, and they found schools for their children, and the National Academy pays a monthly stipend to each of them for their living expenses in Poland. Um, the, um, uh, the important point now is that the scientists are safe, and even if their husbands are back in um, the Ukraine, they have the peace of mind of knowing that their families are safe and well cared for. Um, this picture shows a small part of the group of Ukrainian scientists who are supported by this partnership. Now the speed with which this crisis unfolded prompted the most urgent need for fundraising in the Academy's history. The scale of this was so much larger than Afghanistan and the urgency. I'm grateful for those who stepped forward, including many of you NAS members some of you members gave more than $10,000 to this effort. Um, organizations that stepped forward included the Breakthrough Prize Foundation with a million dollars, the American Chemical Society with half a million dollars, the Sloan Foundation, Carnegie Corporation, McDonald Foundation, um, Packard Foundation, Walder Foundation, Simons, Sheryl and K. Searcy Foundation, the Shanahan Family Charitable Foundation, uh, Linda Hill Philanthropies and Research Corporation for Science, Advances, for Science Advancement. We've raised over almost three and a half million dollars to date, and all of this money is going right to um, Ukraine, uh, th through, well, to Poland for the Ukrainians. But even as we work to help these displaced scientists and keep them safe, and um, keep them employed and keep them connected to an international community. We realized that the real work ahead is how we're going to rebuild Ukraine as a nation. You've all seen the pictures on the news. It's devastating. And uh, so right now, we're getting together with partners from the government, from other um, academies and uh, other um, uh, countries to chart a path forward of how we are going to rebuild Ukraine's research ecosystem and rebuild it to be the best it can possibly be. 
Okay, now let's go on to the second goal in our strategic plan. That's to improve public understanding and appreciation of science. There are um, three objectives under this one, rewarding science communication, promoting understanding of science, and improve the portrayal of scientists. So uh, let's start with the first one. Um, together, the NAS with um, uh, Eric and Wendy Schmidt's um, uh, philanthropy, the Schmidt Futures, have um, put together an award for science communication. Now, there are actually going to be 24 awards in six categories. Half of the awards will go to scientists who are prioritizing science communication, and half are going to go to journalists who really work hard to get the science right and communicate it well. Under the science category, we want to reward graduate students, early career, and mid to later career scientists in three separate categories, three separate competitions. Uh, under journalists, freelancers, early career journalists, and those who are actually reporting in local or regional markets, which as you know is uh, a group that really needs a lot of support right now. So what's really exciting about this is $600,000 in prize money. So this isn't just a certificate or a plaque or something they're going to put on their wall. For some of these journalists, this is incredible real money that is truly going to be an incentive for them to want to put effort into it. So whoopee, $600,000, yay. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, also, uh, under the next objective, promoting uh, understanding of, of uh, science, I wanted to mention a couple things that are going on. Um, one is um, the Science and Entertainment Exchange, which is run by Ann Merchant, along with um, the Division of um, uh, Behavioral Social Sciences and Education, um, had a summer workshop which um, brought together storytellers and health experts to learn best practices for each other. What are the public health issues that need to be communicated and how can storytelling be used in order to communicate it well? Everyone thought this was a really terrific workshop. And, and look at these um, uh, numbers from the post-event uh, survey. 100% of storyteller participants said that they would use something they learned at the workshop from the health experts for their work. 89% of participants found it useful and interesting, and 83% of adolescent health experts said it changed their understanding of how science integrates into storytelling and how they can use storytelling better to get their points across. So I, I thought this was um, pretty, pretty terrific. All right, so um, another one um, that, uh, another objective here is to improve the portrayal of scientists. You know, for a lot of people out there, their, their view of what a scientist is comes from the Big Bang Theory. And you know, we are not all um, Sheldon Coopers. And so um, there's, there's important work that's been done by scientists here at the Academy, such as Susan Fisk, that show that Scientists, in the estimation of the public, are exceptionally competent, but they're viewed as aloof and disinterested in what a typical American might um, care about. So this new project from LabX um, has been developed in order to bring out the human side of scientists, make scientists seem warmer and more approachable. Um, so uh, this was a YouTube series that, that uh, our LabX program started. It's called Chemists in the Kitchen. Now, a lot of you are chemists, and some of you could even cook. You could be on this show, okay? So talk to Ann Merchant about um, doing your own YouTube on this. Um, the, um, in the first year that this um, uh, came out, the Chemist in the Kitchen uh, video series put out seven episodes, each with, that had a total of 370,000 views on YouTube. The audience fell predominantly into the 18 to 34 year old range, which is the target uh, for the LabX program. And um, one interesting statistic is that parents 
made up nearly 50% of the audience, so young parents, parents with young children. Unsurprisingly, the most popular episode for those young parents was the episode on s'mores and melting marshmallows, <laughs> and the chemistry of that and um, the practicality. The, the series boosted the YouTube presence of LabX um, by uh, 150%. And um, it brought in a new audience to Lab X's programming, building on the popularity of cooking shows. I mean, you all know, you look at what's on the, on the television, and it's all these popular cooking shows. So why not science and cooking? Yeah, makes sense. Um, we also saw an increase in the actual uh, watch time for these uh, episodes. So clearly, people were um, getting engaged with them. Um, I'm just going to show you a trailer here from uh, one of the episodes, uh, and this one was on ceviche. Uh, I pulled this out of the, the mantle. It is like a piece of plastic. This is so interesting to me, like uh, just because like it literally thought I, like it's something in the garbage that you find in the ocean. Actually, this is its own body uh, part oh. of it. It just looks oh, like yes. plastic. Oh, <laughs> oh man! What? <laughs> I, I just squeezed the ink sac out. Oh. Oh. So all your chemists, talk to Anne, even if you can only make like popcorn or something, I'm sure it would be uh, uh, a big hit. Okay, let's go on to uh, final goal, goal three, improve the culture and practice of science. Um, there are four objectives under this, setting standards for professional conduct, promoting excellence and diversity in the workforce, transform thinking on the reward system to better support uh, science excellence, and then support the basic research enterprise across all divisions. Um, so I think members um, here are well aware of the landmark report we put out in, um, I think it was 2018, on sexual harassment of women. So we set up an action collaborative to uh, try to uh, promote the recommendations and actually change the culture in academia to be more uh, friendly to women. Um, not the least of our achievements uh, in under trying to um, promote uh, women has been the number of amazing women who have been elected to the academy. I mean, it's just been a, 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 a landslide change. Um, but in addition, this action collaborative um, is trying to ensure that the recommendations are adopted across academia more widely, not just here in the academy. Um, so the action collaborative is a collaboration of the willing. It involves universities, um, uh, coastal oceanographic labs, med schools, et cetera. And they're all coming together to try to find out uh, what works, um, how to measure success, and how to, to catalyze action. Um, last fall, uh, they set up um, four working groups which, um, with uh, representatives who are developing research-based resources to benefit the entire community. The working group on evaluation, I wanted to mention, because after all, if you can't measure something, if you can't evaluate how well you're doing, then there's no way to determine whether your actions are having any impact. So the evaluation working group put out a guidance document on outlying, outlining research-based considerations when measuring sexual harassment prevalence across campus climate surveys. You can imagine that a campus could put out three surveys and show that the um, that the prevalence of harassment is actually increasing, and that might only be because people are less concerned about reporting it. They don't fear retaliation. So we have to you know, understand how to um, um, interpret survey results. Um, there's another working group on prevention, which uh, published um, a perspective paper uh, exploring how procedural justice framework can improve the perceptions of fairness in the creation and revision of harassment policies. And um, uh, there's a response working group that um, you see up here uh, uh, published two approaches aimed at stopping the past the harasser problem. 
How can you make sure that someone doesn't quietly resign from one university and then go on and get hired by another because no one knows what happened? So um, these uh, uh, publications are resources uh, for all of academia. Um, two recent activities at the Academy are targeted at the second goal under Objective 3, and that is to promote excellence and diversity in the STEM workforce. Um, Carnegie Corporation of New York funded us to do a rapid, uh, a, a short turnaround report that was a call to action for science education, building opportunity for the future. Um, the consensus study highlighted better, more equitable science education as an urgent national imperative. The report, even though it came out um, just in the past year, has already reached the lofty level of being in the top 5% of all downloaded reports by the Academy ever. Um, the report was also recently featured by the Hill newspaper in their future of uh, education media. This uh, second activity was a workshop on addressing diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism in uh, 21st century STEM organizations. It attracted 4,000 viewers to that workshop. Um, it's providing the basis for a new consensus study on the same topic. Um, I want you all to know that many of you have donated to the Cicerone Fund. The Cicerone Fund helped nucleate this um, new study and it attracted then funding from many other sponsors. Okay, um, in alignment with the same objective of promoting excellence and diversity, we have a roundtable on black men and black women. They've held a couple workshops in the past year. One was on COVID-19 and the present and future of black communities. As you know, black communities were disproportionately affected by COVID-19. A second one was on educational pathways for black students in science, engineering, and medicine. Um, where are we losing the students and why? What can we do to change the outcomes? And then, of course, a mentoring of black graduate and medical students, postdoctoral scholars, and early career faculty, because mentoring is one intervention which makes a huge difference in um, who stays in the field. We put out some major reports on diversity. Um, one was from um, talking about defense research at historically black colleges and universities and other minority institutions. Um, all the defense research doesn't need to be do, done at a handful of large universities. How can we get more at um, those universities that uh, promote historically underrepresented groups? Also, transform trajectories for women of color in tech. Um, we have a problem of women in tech overall, but a double whammy when it comes to um, minority women. Um, and then finally, the impact of COVID-19 on the careers of women in academic sciences, engineering, and medicine. You have all heard the horrible statistics of the dropout of women from the technical workforce because of COVID-19, because they were bearing the brunt of caring for children and elderly relatives during that time. And uh, what we can do to uh, help get them back into the workforce is important. Um, we also have, I love this program, New Innovative Fellowships to Advance Diversity. A lot of programs for advancing diversity pay diverse young people to come into science and to stay in science and support their work in, in science. This program actually provides $200,000 a year to early and mid-career researchers who have a record of promoting diversity, equity, inclusion in their fields in whatever way. So this is going to the mentors, to the supervisors, to the uh, communicators that are um, actually working on this. So I love this program because it actually, we could put uh, out a lot of scholarships to young diverse people, but if there's no one who's welcoming them into the field, then that money is not being well spent. Uh, and this was funding from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, Another uh, of the objectives under the um, goal three of the strategic plan is to transform thinking on the reward system. Um, the, uh, it's, it's widely accepted now, I think, in science that transparency is essential to producing quality research 
that can be understood, that can be replicated, and then ultimately built upon. And so I, I've just shown here a bunch of uh, areas where um, either making information available or being transparent about it is very important in science, like disclosing your competing interests. Are you funded by drug companies? Do you sit on the board of such and such organization? Describing your methods well so that someone actually knows what you did. Depositing your code in a place where other people can examine it. Depositing your samples or at least making them available to others so that they can uh, recreate your measurements. Disclosing your funders. Who funded the work? Might there be a bias from who gave you the money? Depositing your data where others can get at it. Uh, all of these are important. Um, the, the problem is that the academic reward system is not currently explicitly rewarding these. Um, so to encourage uh, adoption of these, um, we've got a roundtable on aligning incentives with open scholarship. It is now starting its um, second three-year phase of activity, and members of it include leaders from academia, public and private research funders, government agencies, and other U.S. and international stakeholders. So um, uh, they're doing very good work. They produced, for example, a toolkit for fostering open science practices, uh, an actual recipe that you can follow and tools you can use to foster open science. Um, because the purpose of this toolkit is for people to actually use it and adapt it to their institution, it was the first ever National Academy report that was published under a CCBY license, which is the most um, lenient of the open science um, uh, or open access licenses. In addition, the roundtable incubated something called the Higher Education Leadership Initiative for Open Scholarship, or Helios, and that's a community of practice of 65 universities that are working and uh, together to uh, develop and share um, experiences with open practices. Uh, one new activity at the Academy this year is we established something called the Strategic Council on Research Excellence, Integrity, and Trust. The purpose of the Strategic Council is to align policies and incentives across the entire research enterprise, from funders to research institutions to journals and even to organizations that use that science for better public policy. Um, the Strategic Council is addressing issues where policies and incentives are either unclear, they're inconsistently administered, they're duplicative, or misaligned across sectors in the research enterprise. These people are telling you to do this, these people are telling you to do just the opposite. Um, a sampling of the issues that the Strategic Council is taking on, we just had our third meeting um, a little bit more than a week ago. Um, uh, these are the, the main activities we're, we're looking at. For example, streamlining conflict of interest. You all probably fill out a conflict of interest statement at least annually for your university. You do it for every board you're on. You do it when you apply for funding, and you have to do it when you submit to a journal. This is ridiculous waste of your time. So we're working on a simple system where you can populate all these fields once, and then you can um, allow the funder to get the relevant population topics out of a system without you having to redo it every time. Um, uh, the, the goal of the Strategic Council is to, for all these areas, identify promising practices, develop pilot projects, gain stakeholder buy-in across the enterprise, and get a bunch of quick wins. So this is, this is like the busiest committee in the entire academy. Now to the final objective in goal three, and that's supporting the basic research enterprise. And um, one of the ways we support the basic research enterprise is of course through the reports that try to um, help move science forward. Um, I've got one example here that came out of the uh, health and medicine division. Um, and uh, that has to do with um, space radiation and its impact on astronaut health. The previous radiation standard 
had different levels of exposure for male and female astronauts. And this new report recommended that they apply a single space radiation standard to all astronauts, regardless of age or sex. Um, and the, this new standard, which um, has been immediately adopted by NASA, will mean that women and men astronauts have the same longevity in their career program. So there's no disincentive to have women astronauts because NASA says we put all this money into training them, but they have to retire sooner. Um, and it's also going to be uh, important for commercialized spaceflight to know what these standards are. Um, another uh, series of uh, reports which a vast number of academy people were involved in are these two decadal surveys for space science one on astronomy and astrophysics, and the other on planetary sciences called origins, worlds, and life. Um, the, both of them have been uh, very well received um, and had uh, multiple sponsors. Uh, it, it was really interesting how Congress responded to these. Um, Chairs Johnson, Beyer, and Stevens put out a joint statement on Astro 2020, which is the one on the left. Uh, Chairwoman Johnson praised the bold vision and called the nation's astronomy and astrophysics program our eyes and ears to the universe and a gateway for attracting the next generation of STEM careers. What was interesting about Astro 2020 was it took a very careful look at the pipeline for talent, not just what science needs to be done, but where are you going to get the workforce to do this science. Um, Bayer praised the new approach for developing large space missions and the actions for diversifying the workforce. And Haley Stevens of the Research and Technology Subcommittee commented on the extraordinary discoveries in the past decade and praised the plan's vision for the future. Um, even the ranking member, Brian Babin, praised the audacious and ambitious goals that are important to the nation's industrial base and that will benefit all of humanity. Um, Thomas Zerbuchen, who's the Associate Administrator at NASA, sent a letter to the board chair, um, Margie Kivelson, stating in part, he said, I thank you for an inspiring and ambitious decadal vision. The report recommends a coherence, balanced, and implementable program of activities for NASA to undertake over the next 10 years and beyond. I'm particularly grateful for the specific actionable and practical recommendations regarding the state of the profession and the future vitality and capability of the astronomy and astrophysics workforce. Um, the second report on planetary sciences just came out Tuesday the 19th of April, so it's hot off the press but got similar praise from um, Eddie Bernice Johnson and um, from, um, uh, from the um, Subcommittee on Space and um, Astronomics. Uh, people called it cutting edge, discovery-based vision, uh, which will no doubt lead to discoveries we cannot predict. My hope is that it also leads to unprecedented breakthroughs in expanding diversity and inclusion in the planetary sciences profession. So I, I want to thank all the members who contributed to this. I understand that we almost killed you in putting out these reports. Um, the amount of time and effort it put in to truly quality work was amazing, and you all rose to the challenge. So thank you very much. So let me end there with my thanks to not just the people on the decadal surveys, but everyone who volunteered for committees to review reports. People sat on award committees, um, uh, editors for PNAS, for Nexus, for the boards and other activities. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. Uh, it's been an amazing year, and I look forward to better health for all in the coming years. So thank you very much. So now it's time for a break and be back here at, I think, um, 10.15. So you get a 15-minute break. Be back here and we will uh, hear from our new 
members on their research lectures.